Ayn Rand is a really unique figure in the history of thought. She stands for the combination of a number of things in different fields that people often view as opposed, as paradoxical. Objectivity and romanticism, morality and self-interest. And both of these contrasts, or seeming contrasts, come up in particular in connection to the relationship between personal values, which are often associated with emotion, and rightly associated with strong emotion, and philosophical principles, which are abstract and general, and associated rightly with reason. This contrast between reason and passion in the culture and in the history of thought, between the universal and the particular, between virtue and self-interest, is something that Rand demolishes. And I want to talk about that today and about the perspective that objectivism and Rand's artistic work leads to on the relationship between principles and personal values. I want to concretize the need for this by saying a little bit about how this arises in ethics. So conventional people, people who haven't been woke to this point by Ayn Rand, um, think about morality as a scarecrow scaring away their pleasures, as something that's opposed to them and opposed to their own lives. And we, I hope, know better. I think I know better. And I think a lot of people, having read Atlas Shrugged, having read The Virtue of Selfishness, think they know better, understand that morality is a means to your own life and happiness. But what does that mean, and what is that like in practice? Because if morality was just telling you, do what will make you happy, do what you want to do, do whatever you feel like, well, it doesn't seem like you need much advice on that. You just follow your whims, and if you do, you find that it doesn't really make you happy. So what you need is to understand what's good for you, what will make you happy. You need principles to tell you that, and indeed, Ayn Rand gives them to you. But it can feel when you're following principles, particularly in a moment when you want to do something else, when you have a view of what you want and there's a principle and you should do this, you should be productive, you should like this art maybe, if that's how you hold it, it can often feel like it's constraining what you want. I don't want what's good for me, you might think. Or you might have had experiences like that. How, if we're telling you what's good for you, based on some biological fact or philosophical fact, and it leaves you cold, and you're not interested in it. It feels like some imposition from an authority figure. Then on what basis do we really say it's your self-interest? And you get people criticizing objectivists as cold, or automatic, or doctrinaire, or it's some kind of thing you have to rigidly adhere to, just it's called selfishness, but it's not really what people want, or anyway, not really what I want, somebody might say. You get this kind of criticism, even from people who like something about Rand, specifically in the realm of aesthetics. Uh, she tries to tell us what art is good. I really like Beethoven, and she didn't, and it seems like she's telling me I'm bad if I don't. Some people have thought or felt. I think this is an unfair criticism. I don't think it really gets at what she's saying. But there's a reason for it. There's something that makes it a natural thing people think, for people to think, and Rand even mentions it in the beginning of the Romantic Manifesto. The pleasure of contemplating a work of art, she tells us, is so intense, so deeply personal, that a man experiences it as self-sufficient, self-justifying primary, and often resists or resents any suggestion to analyze it. The suggestion to him has the quality of an attack on his identity, on his deepest essential self. And it's not just in art, but in other fields, that the attempt to analyze, to understand one's values the things that mean a lot to one, can feel like an attack. And it feels like an attack to us because we're so used to principles that aren't aimed at helping us define and achieve what we personally want most, but are rather see reason and see principles as a threat to our emotions, as a threat to our passions. If I ask you, why do you want that? Why are you doing that? It sounds like a challenge, not like a friendly question. Let's think about it and explore it. Maybe we'll be able to get it better, you know, get more of what you want. And in the simplest terms, 
what I'm saying here tonight is that we ought to hear these kind of questions. What do you want? Why do you like that? Not as, why do you like that? But as, why do you like that? You know, and let's think about it. Let's try to understand it better and therefore find a way that we can, assuming that it does work out to be good, incorporate it into our lives in the way that will be most fulfilling to us. And if we find out along the way that actually that doesn't work, well, then we'll want to get rid of it. The key objectivist idea here is that principles are a means to our personal values, a means to defining them and a means to achieving them. Now, let me say what I mean by personal values here. I mean your distinctive values, the specific things you go after in life, especially those central ones that fill your life with meaning and that are experienced as ends in themselves and as needing no justification from without. Your career, your lover, your favorite artworks, your best friends. Some of these specific values might be shared with others. You could have friends in common, a career in common, lovers in common only if you're very modern. <laughs> and I don't recommend it, but maybe. Um, certainly you can share favorite artworks, and a lot of us here do, right? Uh, for at least some of them. But none of these values will be shared with everyone, nor even with all good people. You can't find some artwork that's the favorite of everyone decent or someone everyone loves. And the set of these values that you have will be unique to you, even if for many of the values in it, you'll find someone who also has this friend and also loves this book and so forth. You're not going to find someone who's got exactly the same set as you. So that's what I mean by personal values, the distinctive values you have. Now, in objectivism, in objectivist literature, not by Rand herself, but occasionally by Leonard Peikoff, by Tara Smith, these kind of values have sometimes been called optional values, not just these intensely personal ones, but values of the sort that morality doesn't say and aesthetics doesn't say, you've got to love the pieta and um, be a computer programmer, but um, you know, art's important and you should have a career. And so the specific artwork, the specific career, the specific friend is an optional value. And I take it the idea here is that the specific value is optional from the point of view of morality, because morality doesn't specify you should love this concrete thing. I need to be productive, but there are many ways to do that. And philosophy professor, that's just one option. Right? But I've never loved this term optional value, and it's not the one I'm using here tonight, because to me at least, optional connotes too much of the idea that you can take it or leave it. And that's not what's meant by Tara or Leonard when they've used it, but I can't help but hear it that way, at least some of the time. And this casual attitude towards valuing is, uh, I think, wrong and not, not Rand's emphasis. In a set of early notes, for example, Rand complains about people who do not hold anything to be very serious or profound. Here's what she says about them. There is nothing that is sacred or immensely important to them. There is nothing, no idea, object, work, or person that can inspire them with profound, intense, and all-absorbing passion that reaches to the roots of their souls. They do not know how to value or desire. They cannot give themselves entirely to anything. There is nothing absolute about them. They take all things lightly, easily, pleasantly, almost indifferently, in that they can have it or not. They do not claim it as their absolute necessity. Take as an example, Dagny Taggart, who won't give up Taggart Transcontinental while she thinks there's any sliver of a chance to save it. Reardon spending a month flying through the mountains searching for the remains of Dagny's plane. Galt saying that, would be, that there would be nothing to, for him to live for if he allowed Dagny to be tortured. Prometheus and Anthem risking everything for his box of wires. And then the golden one risking everything for Prometheus, risking their lives. These people are not easy come, easy go sorts. Right? These are people who are deeply committed to the things that they're committed to, and that's part of what, objective, what Rand admired, what I think many of us admire about her and her characters, and what her philosophy tells you how to be, how to have things really important to you, how to go all in on your life and on the particular values that make up your life. The personal values then though it's optional from the standpoint of principle which one you have, it's not optional that you have some. And when you have them, they're not optional to you. They're necessities to you, at least the most important ones. They're personal in that they're yours rather than man's in general, 
and they will differ from person to person based on each individual person's nature, maybe some innate differences, based on their histories, what they've experienced, and most importantly, based on the choices you've made at different times. But having some such values is a moral necessity, and morality has a lot to say about the sorts of values involved and the role that they play in one's life. And likewise for aesthetic values and the principles of aesthetics. We all need some art. You might like different art than I do, uh, but we all need some, and aesthetics has something to say about why that is, about what sorts of art we need, and about what kind of roles it could play in your life. And so what we want to think about is the role of principle in making possible intense personal values. So structurally, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about this in the realm of aesthetics. In particular, I'm going to talk about Rourke and Rourke's thoughts in architecture and broaden out from that to the role of aesthetic principles as it relates to values in general. Then I'm going to switch to ethics. I'll say a little bit less about ethics, but I'm going to say something about how to think about your own life in ethical terms. And then I'm going to turn to less theoretically, but more in a kind of personal reflections and inviting you guys to reflect along with me, especially in the Q&A, to personal values and aesthetics. So think about Rourke's buildings. Each building is unique. It's unlike buildings built by anyone else, certainly, but also unlike other Rourke buildings. Each has its own theme. Each is, you know, they're not just mere copies of one another. But each, nonetheless, has a common Rourke quality that makes them recognizable as Rourkes to people accustomed to his style. Wining goes around the country, and every building he likes has something about it, and it turns out they're all by Howard Rourke. When he sees the drawing of the Cortland building in the newspaper, and Dominique asks, who drew this? Or I forget whether Winan asked Dominique or Dominique asked Winan, but both of them immediately see, well, of course. That could only be Rourke. There's a Rourke quality that you can see in the building. They look like his, and not just because he's the only principled architect who ever lived, right? Um, even the only one with his principles. Rourke has principles for how buildings should be designed, and these aren't principles specifically for achieving Rourke-looking buildings. They're principles for designing good architecture. Other architects can follow them, and if they do and do it well, the result won't be buildings that look like another Rourke building. They'll look like a building by that good architect. We can see this in a conversation with Cameron, who has basically the same principles as Rourke, um, and is Rourke's teacher. And Cameron tells Rourke, reflecting on his future career, you won't be a little disciple putting up anemic little things in early Jacobian or late Cameron. Right? You'll be Rourke. Because these are principles that enable one, I mean, Rourke also has a genius. It's not like, you know, the kind of intensely unique character of Rourke is also due to his personal genius. But the, the principles they're following aren't principles that make your buildings come out as all the same. Um, they come out and make your buildings as all the same as anyone else using the principle. They make their principles for getting in touch with things that are unique to you and putting them in the buildings. The ideal is that the right architectural principles, and more broadly, the right artistic principles, make this possible. Standards in art, standards for how to create it and how to judge it, are based on the facts that give rise to the need for art at all and that make art a value to us. And these standards, in particular arts, are based on facts about the particular media and related facts about our means of cognition. See Ren's article, Art and Cognition, for this latter point. See um, the psychoepistemology of art and art and sense of life for the former, but all of these facts that give rise to the need for art and to the standards for art include, as part of the facts, many of the ways in which human beings differ from one another. So there's an abstract fact that we're all the same in having a human mind, in having human needs, but those needs are abstract and there are different concretes under them. For example, human beings all need a philosophy and live by a philosophy, whether held explicitly or implicitly, whether consistent or inconsistent. But we have different philosophies. And we all need values, but we have different concrete values. Moreover, our philosophy, even if it's the same one that you and I held, hold, is held implicitly in the form of a sense of life. And a sense of life is made up of associations of perceptual things. And we're going to have different associations in terms of which we hold a sense of life that corresponds to the same philosophy. 
And if you think of uh, Ankar quoted the really lovely passage from We the Living, uh, either yesterday or the day before, where uh, Ren describes Kira and what things give her the same feeling, right? That's distinctive to Kira, that it's a snail crawling up her leg and people clapping in folk music feel the same to her. Um, you might have the same view of life as Kira abstractly, and yet there are different concretes that are emblematic of that view of life for you because of what things you observed first as a child, where you grew up, what things first caught your interest and engaged you, and so forth. So we all have a different value emphasis, and we all have different concretes that are encoded in our memories and in our characters as emblematic of those abstractions, even when we share the same abstract values. And of course, people don't always share the same abstract values, even if there's a right set of them. So the very facts that give rise to the need for art include the facts of our differences from one another as well as our similarities, even our differences when none of us are making mistakes. Now let's look a little bit more closely at Rourke's specific principles for building. Rourke talks about each building having a central idea, at least if it's well designed, and about how that central idea ought to be an original idea generated by the architect in response to several specific factors inherent in the building, the site, the function of the structure, and the materials. Right, so there's an architectural problem defined by the site and the function of the structure. We need to build a hotel in Astoria. Then there are materials that are available to do that with, and the architect will select some subset of those materials that are suitable to the site and function. And then he'll combine those site, function, and materials to come up with an idea for the building. What's this building going to be about? What's the kind of central idea of the building? And then that central idea serves as a standard of value by which everything else in the building is selected. The result is that the building forms a whole in which each element makes sense and complements and enhances the other. Each conveys the central idea and the character of the mind that created it and that selected all the details in accordance with it. And it is this integration of the building that makes possible the intense responses we have to it. It doesn't seem like a jumble of different things, each of which is nice or not so nice, or even all of which are nice but don't add up to something. It adds up to something and each of the things in it is more intensely appreciated for that. Moreover, we see the personality of the creator of the building in the combination and selection of the things. If you want to get a literary portrayal of what this looks like, read The Fountainhead. Read in particular the description of the buildings in The Fountainhead. If you want some analysis of how these principles are being applied in The Fountainhead, um, I'll shamelessly recommend one of my own essays, um, The Act of Valuing, which is chapter three in a companion to Ayn Rand, where I talk about some of the points I'm making here in more detail. And one reason I'm not going into more detail on this here is because I don't want to repeat myself. But if you want to experience what this looks like, go to a Frank Lloyd Wright building. Uh, spend some time in one. You can tour Falling Water, you can go to wherever, you, I don't know, not wherever you live, but a lot of places in the country, there are Frank Lloyd Wright buildings you can see. And you get this experience. Uh, some friends of mine and I were just uh, rented one and stayed for a few days and toured a few others on the way out here to Cleveland. And uh, we said it's so hard to um, even comment on these because you sound like you're saying cliches from the fountainhead uh, even when you're not and when you're like authentically experiencing it because she puts so well what, these, what this kind of architecture conveys. And Wright isn't Rourke. Their style would be different. A Rourke building wouldn't look like a Wright building, but they are building by the same principles. And so this is another example of the Cameron versus, uh, versus Rourke um, in their unique characters come out in their buildings. And you can see it with, in real life with Wright versus Sullivan and Wright versus some of his students. Um, there are some students of Frank Lloyd Wright whose buildings are lovely and they don't look like Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, but they do have, though to a less intense degree because they're less genius, this kind of integrated character. All right, zooming out from architecture though, the broader idea here that applies to all of art is uh, the broader idea than Rourke's idea of a, a central idea. Um, is what esthetician Tora Buckman calls a core combination. This idea applies differently in different arts. In literature, this role is uh, played by what Rand calls the plot theme, and which he discusses in Principles of Literature in the Romantic Manifesto. In other forms of art, visual arts, it's something else. Uh, for more on this idea, I'm going to recommend uh, Tora Buckman's work, 
Uh, in my view, Torah is our greatest living esthetician and the person with the deepest understanding of Romanticism, especially Rand's take on it. He's here with us at the conference this week, but circumstances didn't permit him to give a lecture. If you see him, you might see if you can get him to share some of his insights on art. Um, more importantly, though, look up his articles, and I want to recommend three in particular, uh, or more than three, actually. Ayn Rand's Literary Romanticism in a Companion to Ayn Rand, Torah's multiple articles in Robert Mayhew's Essays on Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, that is, two books, Essays on Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead and Essays on Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. And uh, there was an article in the Objective Standard in the spring 2008, Casper David, uh, Casper David Friedrich and Visual Romanticism. And I think if you want to think about this idea of the core combination, and in particular about how this method of constructing an artwork allows an artist to create a work that's rational and coherent and true to its own theme, and at the same time expresses the artist's personality and expresses the same personality differently in different works by the same artist that without these being interjected into the work, uh, I think Torah is just um, really, really insightful on this. And uh, since those works exist, I'm not gonna try to say more about that other than just, if you're interested in art and you're interested in personal expression, uh, these are must reads in my view. Thanks, a hand for Torah. So the rest of you can who haven't read this stuff should take that as an endorsement. Uh, really good stuff. Let me shift now to ethics, to how this idea of principles as a means to personal values applies in ethics. If aesthetics is about how to create and evaluate art, and architecture in particular about how to create buildings and evaluate them, what principles are involved, ethics is about how to live a human life, how to create and sustain a life for yourself. And as aesthetic principles are based on the facts that give rise to the need of art and to its value for us, moral principles are based on the facts that give rise to values as such, and they enable us to judge values as such. As Rourke's architectural principles define in abstract terms the problem an architect must solve to design a building, so Rand's ethics defines in abstract terms the problem we each need to solve to, leave, to live our lives. In essence, it's the problem of how a rational animal with free will can select and achieve the values it needs to sustain itself over a lifetime and to experience the concomitant emotion of happiness. The principles specify that in order to do this, we need to value reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Reason as our tool of survival, purpose as our choice of the happiness that this reason uh, will proceed to achieve, and self-esteem as our conviction that we're capable of and worthy of this achievement. Ethics tells us that we need, at least the objectivist ethics, the right ethics, tells us that we need such virtues as rationality, integrity, independence, honesty, justice, productiveness, and pride. And in ethics, in a human life, I think a role analogous to that of the core combination in art is played by one central purpose. This is a theme I also explore in that essay I mentioned earlier, the act of valuing in the companion. What I want to stress here is that the facts that give rise to values, and specifically to values for a human being, include the things that make us different from one another, as well as the things that make us alike. It includes that we form and achieve our values by reason, but reason is an attribute of the individual, and it functions by free will. Your values, then, will have been formed by your mind in response to your specific opportunities and challenges in nature, and in response to the situation set up by your earlier choices. Or else, if you don't use your mind this way, your values will have been accepted from others by default. In which case, that's still a result of your choice. And if you proceed this way, your values will be a mongrel, contradictory set, with the result that you'll be one of those people Rand complained of earlier, who won't be able to commit to any of them or experience the concomitant emotions. And of course, it needn't be that you're fully on one extreme or the other. Most of us have elements of both, and hopefully are working towards being more fully integrated, valuing wholes. And so I want to think about how to think about one's personal values ethically. When we start thinking about ethics, I mean thinking about it conceptually as an adult, not just being told, you know, that's wrong when you're a kid. When you start thinking about ethics, when you read a work like 
the fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged or the virtue of selfishness and you're prompted to reflect on it or an ethical work by some other philosopher, right? You already have a lot of values formed. Just like when you start learning to be an architect, if you do, or a painter or a musician or any other kind of artist, you already have a lot of values in that realm. You wouldn't start trying to learn to be an architect and thinking about what principles are involved in good architecture unless you liked buildings. And that means unless you liked some buildings. And then you'd be thinking about why that is and what gives rise to that. Likewise, you're not going to start thinking about ethics unless you have some values. And so when you get into thinking about ethics, you're motivated into, to do it by the values you already have by the love you have of the life that you're leading, or at least the potential you see for that life. And that includes some of the concretes of it. So you can't get into ethics and then rededuce your values from scratch. Well, all right, I choose to live. Got to be rational. I haven't been being rational in figuring this out up till now, but I'm going to now. Um, I need a purpose. Jeez, what should I do? Um, and you have no choice, no values at all to judge on in what you do. But you think, well, I got to get some values to have a purpose. What can I like? Well, it's got to be pro-human life, I guess. So food, I could be a farmer. I mean, that's not how, how anyone could possibly do it. You might be changing careers or first trying to come up with a career, right? Um, and that's a good thing to use ethics as guidance to do. But you're going to, like make a list of what values you already have. And as I look at it, the audience, I'm seeing some people who've told me stories about how they've done this in selecting their career. These are the things I'm interested in. These are the things I value. Right? Now, you might think about why, and you should, but you, you start with an existing set of values. And what you're doing is you're reflecting on, you have to take your values seriously, not try to generate them from philosophy. Take your existing values seriously, and then use philosophy to understand and in some cases, evaluate them. I mean, ultimately, to evaluate them. But you don't deduce your values from scratch. And the reason why I hesitate on saying you evaluate your values is I want to counter any idea that what you need to do in philosophy, whether in aesthetics or in ethics, is to conduct a sort of inquisition on your values, to expose the errors that you're sure are lurking there. And there probably are some errors somewhere. And in the process, you'll solve them. But that's not what ethics is about, right? If you find that you value something, you want to inquire into why you value it, into what it does for you, into why it is already a value for you, not in a suspicious or circumspect or inquisitorial way, but in a friendly way, as the person who values the thing. Like, well, what is it that I get out of this? Why do I love this work? Why do I love doing this? Why is education important to me? Whatever the thing might be. And what you learn by doing this is, so when you do this, you can use ethical theory, or if it's a work of art, and we'll get to that in a moment, aesthetic theory as a guide to help you do that. Ethical theory tells you what some of the main human needs are and what in abstract terms a human life has to look like. And then you can evaluate particular things by thinking about how they fit into that. Is, is this why I like this? And so forth. And likewise, in aesthetics, it tells us what we need art for and some of the roles that it plays for, and the central role it plays for us. And you can think about, well, is that why I like this movie? And how does it relate to that? But you're using aesthetic theory as a guide or ethical theory as a guide to understand why your existing values are valuable to you, what you get out of them. And what you learn when you do this helps you to tailor the value better into your lives so that it integrates better with the other values. And you can get the most out of it. Now, sometimes when you do this, you'll find that one of the values doesn't fit and that you need to reject it. But that's not the majority case. And you shouldn't be looking with a kind of angry hostility to yourself. Now, this issue comes up somewhat differently in aesthetics and ethics. In ethics, the principles and standards are about valuing as such. The principles govern all values. So if something turns out to be out of line with ethical principles, and those ethical principles are true, then the thing isn't really good. If you want something and you're pursuing something, and you figure out that it contradicts the objectivist ethics. Well, all right, maybe you've applied the objectivist ethics wrong and you should think, make sure you've got it right. But if you have got it right, then either the objectivist ethics is wrong or you should stop pursuing this thing. And you should think about which of those is true. And I'm talking about, you know, for example, you find you just really want to be a mafioso or a nun. 
or to develop a smack habit or something, right? I mean, I'm using funny ones, but there are ones that are less severe like that. Um, you really want to continue running, or less obvious, you really want to continue running a railroad in the world of Atlas Shrugged. Um, you really want to continue supporting a certain political party or group because you're used to it and invested in it, and it's, you're starting to realize that it's actually come to betray your values. Right? So there are going to be cases that aren't funny. But if you're right that this thing um, is inconsistent with moral goodness, that it's wrong, that means that it's inconsistent with the requirements of your life and all of your other values that make up your life, then you shouldn't do it. If some of your values are bad as judged by the objectivist ethics, and if the objectivist ethics are true, and you should keep thinking about whether it's true, right? Uh, then it's not a genuine value and you should reject it. In aesthetics, that's not exactly the case in the same way. Because aesthetic principles don't judge all of value, they judge art as art. If you find yourself really liking to look at some painting, say a Menadrian, and you uh, learn that Ayn Rand thought that that was an art, and you think about it and you think, you know, she's right. It's not just she's applied her own principles wrong, and it's not that her principles are wrong. I think her principles are right about what art is and why art is value, and I think she's right, uh, or uh, th those around her are right in thinking this thing is an art. That doesn't necessarily mean you should stop looking at it. You might have some other reason other than that it's art to want to look at the thing. You might find it interesting as a cultural artifact to understand where the culture is. You might think it's good um, interior decoration, but not, though not art. You might think it's a good investment opportunity. I mean, it's not art, but people seem to be buying this stuff. Um, an eloquent example of the state of the culture. You might find it a significant example of an important event in your life that happened in a room where this thing was framed and uh, every time you look at it, it reminds you of this event. Or again, as a piece of interior decorating. Um, some of these examples of ways in which you might value this, this uh, painting are wholly non-aesthetic. But others are aesthetic in the broad sense that they have to do with the character of one's experience. And I want to talk about these other kinds of values than um, the value that makes something that's great art that might be part of what attracts you to certain artworks. So far, all the ones I've named are positive ones, ones that are ethically relevant. There's nothing wrong with you if you think, I don't think this is good art, but um, it's interesting to look at for this other reason. Even if you don't know exactly yet why, but you think, I don't think it's great art, but I, you know, it doesn't mean you've got to run for the hills from the thing. There are also some reasons that are ethically bad. Maybe you like looking at the thing because it shows up all those smarty pants who think they're so great because they express values and there's all this heroism and people, you know, you could have some kind of nasty wanting to destroy or run down art motivation and I think some people do uh, for certain modern art pieces and this is the motivation that's portrayed in the fountainhead uh, in the kind of circle of artists artists used in scare quotes, around Ellsworth Tui, Ike the genius and such people who want to elevate plays to tear down Ibsen, uh, elevate their kind of no skin off your ass play, uh, change to nose for polite company. Um, but not every uh, interest somebody might have in something that is not art or not great art is, is coming from that kind of place of nihilism. And so you want to think about you know, why you like the things you do whether or not they turn out to be art, and if they turn out to be art, whether they're great art or mediocre art. And there are a lot of different values that can be involved other than that they're great art. So let me just, um, some of these values, again, are totally divorced from aesthetics. It's just um, an association or, um, you know, you think it would be a good block the sun out or something because it's dark colors and it won't reflect too much in your room. But some of these things are broadly aesthetic. And I want to mention some broadly aesthetic values that are outside of the focus of the Romantic Manifesto. What I mean by a value being aesthetic in this sense is that it has to do with the character of one's perceptual experience. This value is an aesthetic value because what I'm valuing is that my experience have a certain experiential character and this is an object that gives it to me or an activity that gives it to me. So broadly aesthetic values that are, it's not like the Romantic Manifesto puts these down or doesn't think they're values, but it's just not the kind of thing it's focused on. 
So partner dancing. There's a discussion of dance in the Romantic Manifesto, but the kind of dance that's discussed there is like ballet or tap dancing, choreographed dancing on a stage that everyone's watching, and that is treated as a form of art. But what about you go ballroom dancing or swing dancing, which is something a lot of people enjoy doing. It's not everything that's said in the Romantic Manifesto about dance is applicable to that. What exactly is the value of that for you? Well, it has something to do with the character of the experience. It has something to do with the kinds of things about dance as an art form that are discussed in the Romantic Manifesto. It's not exactly the same, but it's, um, it's worth thinking about. And I think it's broadly within the realm of aesthetics, though not perhaps within the realm of philosophy of art proper. Um, interior decorating and design. I use the example of a Manadrian painting. Marianne Suri's, I don't know if she was quoting Ayn Rand or not, um, one said that for modern non-representational art, there are two schools, the uh, neat and the messy. And Manadrian is the neat school, and they look nice as like wallpaper or you know, uh, something you might have in the background. Um, and these things are values, uh, possibly anyway, as interior design. Um, you might look at the rug here in the room. You might think you might like it or not like the rug, but uh, it's clearly not art, at least in the sense of what uh, we mean by art, what Ayn Rand means by art, and if you framed this rug and put it on a wall, uh, you would be treating it as art. But what about as a rug? I mean, if we had like a tapestry made of the Mona Lisa and that was the rug in this room, that would probably be worse as a rug than this kind of oddish pattern, whether you like this pattern or a more neat one, this is a little more in the messy school, uh, better. Right? So interior design, there's something aesthetic, something to do with the character of your experience about that. Maybe it has to do with sense of life or with something else. We can think about what goes into these kinds of reactions, and it's worth thinking about them, but it's just not the kind of thing that the Romantic Manifesto is particularly interested in. Um, what about sports? That's something that Tara Smith has talked a lot about. People enjoy contemplating sports. Uh, it seems like some of the reasons involved in that has to do with sense of life kind of considerations and the need to experience achievement and a way that you can do it. Um, somewhat like art, but it's certainly not art. Uh, that's something that you know, we could have a theory of the value of watching sports and also of playing sports. Now maybe you enjoy playing sports because you get exercise, in which case you're not doing it for the joy of the activity itself, but, you, but for some consequence that's gonna come from it. Um, but a lot of people experience the joy of playing. It's fun. I like playing this sport. Uh, I, I'm glad that it makes me healthy, but I like it in something like the way I enjoy, um, I enjoy uh, looking at an artwork or partner dancing, which maybe even is a sport. And, of course, watching sports on TV doesn't make you healthy. So, uh, and yet a lot of people enjoy doing it. And then putting aside sports in particular, which is kind of... Um, games that involve you know, a lot of muscular exertion and running about and such, um, but other kinds of gameplay. You play chess or you play checkers or a Scrabble, which Ayn Rand enjoyed playing. Harry Binswanger has anecdotes about how they used to play it. Right? What's the value of doing this? Um, in some of them, at least, there seems to be some kind of aesthetic component to what kind of games you like. Something about the character of the experience, what it feels like to use your mind in that way, what kind of a world you feel like you're playing in that game. Ayn Rand didn't like chess because of this kind of consideration, a world of kind of pointless, um, intricate mental effort that um, doesn't lead to anything and where you're, you know, sort of constant calculation with no overarching point. So. Again, that's not me putting down chess, that's just uh, her take on it at the time. So there's this realm of value that's just not, some of which is closer to art, some of which is further from it, but I think is broadly aesthetic that's not really focused on in the Romantic Manifesto. The Romantic Manifesto focuses on the highest possible that we can get out of art and of our experience of it. It's a manifesto for a particular school of art that concretizes a particular kind of metaphysical value judgment, the view that there is free will. And the earlier material in the book, uh, the material on general aesthetics, things like art and sense of life, philosophy and sense of life, the psychoepistemology of art, art and cognition, even the philosophy of literature, right? This material on aesthetics is uh, there to provide a background for setting up the manifesto in the last chapters of the book. Um, so the overall the point of this book is that this profound aesthetic value of romantic literature in particular is possible to defend it from attacks on it 
and to tell us of how we can get more of this value in our lives. It's like what it is that you've loved about the fountainhead, if you love the fountainhead, why it exists, and how you can get more of it. Why I, Ayn Rand, wrote books like this, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and Anthem and We the Living, uh, and for you who love them, here's background material on aesthetics that will help you understand and evaluate art in general. In that context, let me tell you about romanticism. Let me tell you about this great art of the 19th century. You can find this stuff. There's more, and maybe some of you can make more stuff like this, right? This is, uh, I think, what we're getting in this book as a whole, and just, I, I really agree with Ankar's takeaway from the book. You know, explore, in particular, 19th century art uh, of the Romantic school if you want to find more of the universe that you loved in Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead. There's a lot else in the book, of course, uh, about why you love it, and there's a lot else about what the value of art is in general, but it's not a book about geared to understanding all of your aesthetic preferences in every dimension in every area. It's the material on general aesthetics there is set up, to, again, to, is, is tailored to set the stage for the manifesto that's to come. So all of these other values that I mentioned that you could have from activities that are not art at all, or hardly art, or it's not clear if they're art, like partner dancing, or again, photography, or interior design, or sports watching or playing, or watching or playing of other games, right? If you're trying to understand everything about your aesthetic values and your reactions, you want to think about the values that are involved in these activities too and why you like them if you do. And you also want to notice that some of these kinds of values, which might be different from the ones that are most in view in the Romantic Manifesto, might be part of your experience of, of um, center of the page artworks too. Let me tell you a little bit about my own experiences here, my own thoughts on some of this. In my own case, the aesthetic experience I've had from Rand's novels is unparalleled. In a way, she's my only aesthetic love. In the sense of aesthetic love where it's unparalleled with romantic love the only thing in the realm of art that's at the level to me of, you know, I want to marry it. That's at the level of the deepest, most personal relationships I've had in my life and my choice of career. But there are lots of other, not lots, but other, serious and deep experiences I've had, some of which I've gotten, you know, in the realm of art, some of which I've gotten by exploring outside of my comfort zone, as Yaron and Ankar discussed yesterday, particularly in sculpture, architecture, and romantic music, all of which are things I didn't grow up with around me. There was hardly any classical music in my household, classical in the sense of symphonic, um, in the sense you'd find it in the classical music section of the uh, music store when we had music stores, not um, in the sense of classical as opposed to Baroque or romantic. Uh, there was hardly any classical music at all in my household, uh, none of it romantic. Uh, there was no sculpture, and there wasn't really, uh, you know, I didn't grow up knowing much about architecture. Uh, in the case of all three of these arts, what I found are particular artists, in the case of architecture, really only one artist, uh, right, that I really respond to, uh, and that really mean a lot to me, but I've not become a connoisseur of any of these artists. I've not become someone with a real deep and developed knowledge and taste in these fields. I'm learning more as I go, and some of them, I, it's a higher priority to learn more than I do, and I find that as I learn more, I can appreciate more. But there's a depth of understanding and so of appreciation that I don't have. And I'm telling you about my own case here as a model for thinking about, about yourselves in this. The contrast for me in my thinking about um, say romantic music or architecture, is that there are other forms of art um, that I know a lot about and can appreciate. I feel like I get everything that's there to get about. Um, in particular, popular music, by which I mean um, jazz, rock, blues, country, standards, that whole realm of music, um, which I know quite a lot about. I was interested in it since I was a, a child, have a real understanding of it, play many of the interests involved, and did prior to um, having read the Romantic Manifesto, for example, 
And the kind of background knowledge I have here gives me a feeling that I can milk every bit of value out of this. And I do get a lot of value out of that. By contrast, I feel like there's a lot in classical music that I like, and I don't have the same level of understanding, particularly automatized understanding. And so I think I get out of it a smaller percentage of what's there, though I still get a lot. Um, and when I listen to, say, a piece by Dvorak, whom I really like, or Mendelssohn, or Rachmaninoff, I feel a fairly intense aesthetic experience. I feel like this has more to offer on whole than, say, a Beatles song, um, as much as I like the Beatles. But I also feel like I don't get everything that's there to get out of it in the way that I do from the popular music. There's a way in which I get more out of it and a way in which I get less out of it. And that's something that's interesting to understand and think about yourself, because you probably all have parallels in different works of art, in different fields of art, based on what you're more used to, based on what you understand, based on what you have developed the capacities to appreciate. Um, one way of paraphrasing this last point um, is with a line from Mick Jagger, uh, whose songs I don't particularly like, but it's apt here. I know it's only rock and roll, but I like it. Um, I don't want to put down rock and roll too much. I think there's a lot of really good music, popular music, rock music, etc. But if you get a lot out of that music, and you really know why you do, it doesn't, you can really fully own that and not think that it's the greatest music ever, not think that it's the highest art ever. You can think it's good and think what's good about it and really identify what's good. Now, some of you might disagree with me and think that the Rolling Stones or Rush or Yes or Led Zeppelin or John Coltrane, um, to pick another kind of example, is at the level of Dvorak or Mendelssohn or Rachmaninoff or Beethoven uh, in terms of the kind of availability of profound aesthetic experience from him. And we can talk about that, and we don't have a kind of fully objective uh, theory of music where we could prove that. Some of you might find that um, you know, some TV series you're watching, uh, you might think on the grounds of aesthetic principles, uh, it's as good as Dostoevsky or Hugo. And let's take Hugo um, in particular. But I worry that people are sometimes driven to think that defensively because they think what aesthetics tells them is you should like it less than you do. And you should like Rachmaninoff more than you do. And I don't think that's what it tells you, even if you think that there's more to be had here. It's, as Yaron said, about expanding, not about eliminating things, or even downgrading things. Just look and see if you can, what kind of values you can find from this music, from this artwork. And separate out what really matters to you, and matters to you for good reason, which reason you can even identify from what's the uh, most profound artwork. Take seriously what you like, and try to identify what you get out of it. Now, what are the roles of Rand's aesthetic principles in doing this? Well, Rand tells us about the psychoepistemological value of seeing metaphysics concretized and concretized well, the value of seeing a worldview put in perceptual form, whether it's your worldview or someone else's, the kind of clarity and sense of understanding that you get, and just the vividness of it, of seeing ideas that you might have to engage with or grapple with or glimpse in people in other forms, or maybe in yourself if you hold them, seeing it made real for you, seeing what determinism, for example, really means. Then, of course, there's the added value when it's the expression of your own metaphysical values, your own sense of the world. You get emotional fuel from it. You get a sense of self-understanding from it. So self-understanding about what it is that I value, what is my own view of the world, what does it look like in practice, and you get emotional fuel from that. Sometimes you also might get, if there's something in your own worldview that's intention for you, a sense of understanding of something about yourself that you might be uncomfortable with, that you might be in the process of changing. For example, a songwriter that I really like is Bob Dylan. And I think he's a really excellent songwriter, and particularly if you consider him as a poet, I think he's a good poet. And there's a lot 
in his work that I appreciate as poetry or his song um, from an aesthetic perspective. There's a lot also in some of his works that resonates with me personally, but not all of it do I like. So some of his works that I found touching, particularly at a certain period, as I thought about them and what I found touching about them, it felt too much like he was an astute victim of his life, kind of commenting perceptively and deeply and evaluating the things that were happening to him, but not ready to do anything to change them or make his life better. There was a kind of passive contemplator quality and a kind of view that you can't really have effects in the world in Dylan's poetry and in his songs. And particularly at certain periods of my life, I felt like that informed that kind of a feeling about the world informed too much of my own sense of the world. And as I thought about it, I didn't think that's true. And listening to those songs and seeing what response I had to them, and I still love some of those songs, made me think, yeah, there's something wrong here. There's a need to be more assertive. There's something in Dylan and maybe in me that I don't like and that I can change. And so part of what you learn from Ayn Rand's uh, view of aesthetics is the psychoepistemological value of seeing principles, of uh, seeing metaphysics concretized, concretized well, whether it's your own metaphysics, your own view of the world, or one that you wholly reject. The special value that has when you're seeing aspects of your own worldview concretized, either because it gives you fuel to live by that worldview, or because it puts it in a form where you're able to contemplate it better and maybe to reassess some parts of it. So this is what Rand's aesthetic principles give you. And I think it's really valuable to think about the things you like in art, to try to identify what it is you respond to in them, why you like them, to use these principles as a guide. What's the scene here? What metaphysical values, what view of the world and its possibilities are being presented? What does this artwork treat as important? And what does it treat as unimportant? What would it be like to live in this world um, and see how much does that, the fact that it's, it's doing that and making clearer what certain worldviews mean, what's important to different people of different types, and in particular what's important to you, is that what you value about it? If not, what do you value about it? And I think it's important not to fake here when you're doing this. Not to try to pigeonhole your aesthetic values and their source into these categories. Not to think, I love this, so it must be great art. I love this, so it must express my own sense of life, even if it's not great art uh, or love. I really like it. Um, it's an important value to me, and I believe in free will, so it must be romantic. Think about, like, what is it that I'm liking about this? Leonard Peikoff gave a, a good and humorous example of a time he got Ayn Rand mad at him. There was a movie he came back from just loving and gushing about it. You've you got to see it. And so she goes out and sees it and really didn't enjoy it at all. And it wasn't at all like she said it was. And it turns out the actress in it was just beautiful. Uh, Leonard really liked her. And she was just, as he describes it, just staring at her all through this movie and didn't even catch the rest of the film. And that's fine. I mean, it, that is, it's, it's fine that that's what he got out of the film. There are some very pretty people. And it's worth looking at them, right? But um, it's a mistake to think that... Um, that um, then the thing is great art. And it's easy to make that mistake kind of just passively if you, you just get excited about something. But there's also a kind of sometimes a felt need to do it if you're trying to justify yourself before a kind of inquisition in your soul. And I sometimes uh, think I see this with people. So just like, what do I like about of this? And don't try to put it in, in... If the terms of Ayn Rand's aesthetic theory help quickly, you to see what that is, what you're liking about it or disliking about it, good, and use them. But don't try to force it. I mean, I've heard debates about whether death metal is nihilistic or romantic. The name suggests more likely the former than the latter. But, and people arguing and criticizing one another about it and so forth. Slow down and like, what do I like out of this? Do I feel like, maybe I like it because I feel energized after I listen to it. I don't like it, by the way. But what is it? And, um, 
and then go from there, and then see if you can connect it to these deeper things. Not all upbeat music, for example, is romantic. Maybe you like it because it's upbeat and you feel energizing from that. And so in this context, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the complementary values you might get from art, uh, besides these deepest ones that are um, described in the Romantic Manifesto. Some of these values may ultimately be explained by the deeper ones described in the Romantic Manifesto. Maybe not all of them are, maybe all of them are. But just notice these things are more proximate things that might be, um, might be driving you. Um, beauty. Yaron and Ankar discussed yesterday the value of being surrounded by beauty, more of a value for, An for Yaron than for Ankar. Note, beauty is not a theme in the Romantic Manifesto. Occasionally it's discussed, but do you like this because it just seems beautiful to you? And then what do you mean by that? Here's another value that I think we all get out of a lot of art and isn't much discussed, and it's its relation to aesthetic, to the specifically artistic values, is interesting to contemplate. It's why I put sports up there as an example earlier. Virtuosity, seeing something difficult done really well, is a value to people. So really fast and precise playing of an instrument in a guitar solo or a violin concerto, the delicacy of a brush stroke, um, etc. Now, when you have something that's uh, great art on other grounds, that uh, is conveying a metaphysics, that's conveying it well, the virtuosity of how it's done adds to that enjoyment. But it also could be of value outside of that context too. You could, um, people value virtuosity in sports and competitions and watching it. Um, you can value it in paintings separate from your thinking about how good the painting is as art. So take like Picasso's Cubist stuff. I don't know if any of you've looked at these paintings. They're weird, and I don't like the world they project, but it seems like it would be really hard to do it. It's not like a smear or some neatly painted lines. It's somehow projecting multiple perspectives onto the same canvas. The attention to detail, it seems like, wow, it's impressive this guy could produce this thing. Uh, that took real skill. I don't like it. I'm not sure about even what I think about it, its aesthetics merit, but the virtuosity is something interesting to look at about it, and maybe someone really enjoys that. Um, something similar to virtuosity, it's a kind of virtuosity, is wit. And some novels are very witty. Some music might even be witty in the kind of uh, uh, tone it con connotes. Um, I'm not saying I think there is metaphysical value judgments involved in judging virtuosity and wit and in responding to them, but you can respond to these things in things that aren't art in like a good conversation. What about play and playfulness? Improvisation, riffing, I think a lot of the value of jazz and of other forms of music that involve improvisation and of improvisational acting and improv comedy, for example, is that there's a value to being playing. There's a value to doing something in the moment off the cuff, particularly when you're doing it with other people and the give and take of it. And there's a certain mental set that you're in. And I think the different attitudes one could have towards play, the different kinds of play one likes, the way that ways that one can be playful does reflect metaphysical value judgments. Um, so I think it is sort of broadly artistic and it's definitely an element of some forms of art, but you might really value that and value a certain form of play. That's part of the fun of improvising in music, part of the fun of partner dance, improv, acting. Um, and I think you might enjoy consuming playful things. And so you might really like jazz, for example, improvisational jazz, even if the melodies that came out, you know, if they were horrible, you probably wouldn't like them, but even if the melodies that come out of the improviser aren't things that you'd like as well if you thought this had all been transcribed by a composer and he wrote this, the kind of spontaneity of it and appreciating it as something created spontaneous might be part of the aesthetic experience. It is for me, and I, I really like jazz. Um, then there's instrumental value of some art as a means to some other activities. You might like some music because you can dance to it. You like it as part of an activity of dancing, which maybe you like for holy aesthetic reasons or for holy reasons of its, its high art or for, um, as a basis for play and improvisation. Now, I don't really have 
a theory of all of these values. I just want to point out that they're there and that they're some of the things you might think about in thinking about why you like the art that you do or why you like the things that you do, some of which it's ambiguous whether they're even art. One or two others I, might, I want to suggest. Some people like art and like appreciating things as an occasion for erudition. And I think there's a somewhat healthy and an unhealthy version of this. Um, some people are buffs of things. They like to know everything about like the Civil War or something. Um, my dad's like this with the Beatles. He's really interested. I know a fair amount about them too, but he's really interested in all kinds of facts about them. What, tune, what guitar did this guy have at this time and when did he get it? And people who have values, I think it's kind of a, a secondary thing around a value you have for other reasons, enjoy just learning a lot about them. And maybe you've enjoyed or know a lot about a certain subject and independent or not wholly dependent on the aesthetic merit of the subject, you enjoy like playing a trivia game about it. That's not a bad thing necessarily. It is a bad thing if you think someone's the greatest artist because you've memorized the most facts about him and you're resistant to thinking about what other art might I like because I don't have, you know, I won't win Jeopardy if, uh, if um, uh, Michelangelo comes up, but I will win it if um, the guy who draws Dilbert comes up, so I think Dilbert's better art. I mean, that's, that would be weird and a major value hierarchy inversion. But if you just, you know, you really like Dilbert, I don't know why I picked that example, because I don't like Dilbert. But anyway, if you really like Dilbert and you know a lot about him and you enjoy the kind of skill of recall of that, you know, okay, that's why you like that. And that's not a bad thing. You just think about where it fits into your hierarchy of values. On a little bit of a more serious, though, version of this, um, part of what goes into our ability to appreciate art is kind of recognitional abilities, familiarity with genre and with some of the... Um, features of that genre that let you know immediately when something's novel or different or a departure. This is why, for example, at concerts there are notes that you read in the program to kind of hip you if you don't have that much context to, the, to this work of art, to some of the things you might need to know that will appreciate, help you appreciate it better. And your differential responses to different arts might depend on which of your knowledge and uh, recognitional abilities you've developed and to what extent. There's a kind of fun in just using these abilities once we have them. And I think that the enjoyment of using these recognition abilities, these abilities to discern things, enhances what are already aesthetic experiences and can also make fun some things that aren't. One field in which recognitional capacities and using them, I think, is primarily what the experience is about is, for example, um, being a wine taster. I mean, it's not that the better wine tastes that much better in itself. It's that, I mean, maybe it is, I don't know. But a lot of it is the value of like, you can discriminate, this is jammy, you know, and so forth. And you've got this vocabulary and there's the joy of applying that vocabulary, at least to the limited extent that I could appreciate uh, wines. That's part of what I enjoy about it. And I gather it's what people who've really uh, gone far into this do. Um, So there's a lot more I can say on this, but I think we have about a, a little less than a half hour left. So I think I should stop now for questions. Let me give you some concluding advice rather than going into more personal anecdotes about my engagement with different forms of art. Summing up some of what I've said. Principles in ethics and in art should be means to defining better and achieving your own personal values as opposed to being a straitjacket to which you feel you must conform or an authority figure reigning in the sphere in which you can pursue your own happiness. To use values in this way as a means of better defining and achieving your own values uh, requires taking your current values seriously. That means asking friendly, non-inquisitorial questions about why you value what you do. You can use Rand's philosophy, the kind of deep points about the nature of art and our need for it, the idea of a sense of life and metaphysical value judgments and psychoepistemology and concretization in the Romantic Manifesto to help you do this in art. You should use these similar ideas, the uh, principles of ethics to help you do this in ethics. 
as you proceed, you're evaluating both the philosophical principles and your value, and your values, and you're evaluating your application of the former to the latter. But what will hopefully come out of it is a better appreciation of the things you value, those values being more tightly integrated into a life, any contradictory ones that might be found along the way being expunged, in such a way that you can get more out of everything you value and get more out of life in general. And again, in the process of doing this, make use of the philosophical principles, but don't try to pigeonhole your experience into them. Often there are closer to the surface identifications that you need to make that either reflect the type of value other than the one you might be thinking, you might be looking for if you're in the field of aesthetics. Maybe it's just not a metaphysical thing that you're enjoying here, not something that comes out of metaphysical value judgments, but something else uh, altogether that is, in fact, valuable. Or maybe it is a type of value that will ultimately be explained by the deepest principles of aesthetics. But before you can do that, you need to get a more proximate identification of it. It's like, what I enjoy is the virtuosity of this. What I enjoy is the feeling of wit of this. What I enjoy is whatever it might be. So look for those things. Look for them in a non-inquisitorial, friendly manner, in a non-pigeonholing manner, in a manner where you're using principles to try to get a better purchase on what it is that you want out of life and how you can get it in art and in general. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hi. I was wondering if you could comment on, um, I'm interested in Ayn Rand's kind of descriptions of herself and her reaction to the characteristic of lightness in art. I mean, she, you know, this was true with her tiddlywink music, and I think if you read her notes on her heroes um, and how she drew them up, she described them as, you know, light and this lightness, and for me, when I read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged for the first time, I actually didn't have that, you know, there was kind of a darkness and heaviness that was in my reaction, but as I've become more benevolent, I'm starting to kind of grasp and concretize that characteristic, but in your own research and, and thoughts about it, I wonder if you could maybe comment on, on that, maybe what Rand was philosophic part of her philosophy or her psychology that would have led to that being a, uh, something she, uh, an element that she valued, that lightness? Well, I think what you see in, um, in her fiction and in some of her notes, I don't want to try to go too much into her psychology. I mean, I didn't know her and I'm not a psychologist. But um, what you see coming out in her writing is This idea that the struggles, the difficulty, the um, not the kind of healthy struggle of an adversary you have to defeat and you're enjoying the process of overcoming it, like what, what Dagny describes in seeing math as an adversary she was going to master, but the kind of evil and the dreariness and the kind of sometimes torturous experiences that people have to deal with. Um, a a sense that those things aren't what matters about life. They don't characterize life as a whole. That's not what life is about. Uh, in a world where it often seems like that might be what life is about. So that it's a struggle to maintain that perspective. And I think you get that idea in a lot of Rand's novels. So there's um, the Kira, uh, Kira who uh, has a light operetta song. I forget exactly the line but as a battle hymn, as a march, right? She's someone who wants to retain this life, light, joyous, the world is a place where we can be happy and achieve things, sorrow and suffering is unnecessary, and is in Soviet Russia where she's locked in airtight uh, and where everyone around her is being destroyed and dying and her values are being stripped away from her one by one. And it, Ayn Rand is Kira in this sense, right? She's the person who had this kind of view of life and who was in this environment and who managed to escape it. But you see this same kind of theme occurring in, in, in several of her novels. It's definitely the theme for Dagny in Atlas Shrugged. It's the theme of Halley's 
a fourth and fifth concertos, if you read the descriptions of them, there's this, why does there have to be all this suffering? I understand that it's unnecessary, and yet I can't seem to get rid of it. And why is the worst suffering inflicted on those who see that it's not necessary? What's gone wrong here? And then Galt gives a solution to that problem, and then you have Halley's fifth concerto, which is this laughing release from unnecessary suffering. And um, so I think there's a kind of conviction what you find in a lot of France art is the conviction that the world is a benevolent place, that value achievement is possible, that one can make the most of one's life, that life is not about suffering. What you see is that conviction under fire. The maintaining of that conviction in situations where it's difficult. And she herself lived through situations where it was difficult to maintain it. And so this kind, there's, that gives a kind of conflict of light and dark, um, of light and heavy in a way a kind of lightness that's trying to escape and ultimately in the novel succeeding from escape in escaping from this gloomy burden. Do you think there are any principles applicable to all or most people in terms of number one, the amount of time you spend pursuing and enjoying the arts, and two, the amount of time you spend revisiting works that you already know that you either like or love as opposed to looking for new things? Uh, if there are any principles, I don't know them. Uh, so I won't spend more time trying to guess at what they might be. But it's a good question. Uh, I, I doubt there are universally applicable principles, but there are probably um, some good guidelines. If you're not spending any time on art, and if you're only looking at things you've seen a million times before, probably you should get out of your comfort zone. But, uh, you know, how much... I, I'm not going to say spend an hour and a half a day on it or something. One thing that makes me very angry is I've seen uh, some people who call themselves objectivists attack other people's personal values as that's just subde subjective. You're just indulging your whims. You have no justification in terms of objectivist principles for liking that particular thing. And this, even sadder is there are victims who say, well, you know, I've always liked that, I've always wanted that, I can't justify it, but that's just me. Could you speak about why personal values are not subjective and mm -hmm. why they're sacred and important? Yeah, so first I want to say I think that kind of tendency comes from an insecurity about one's own values, uh, when people are being in this attacky, hostile place. Um, why are personal values not subjective? Well, they can be fully articulated, rationally understood. Uh, you can really know why you value something and why I value it but not you. You know, it's just this what facts about me make this super important to me, or it might be uh, not important to someone else. You could have it fully objective, fully articulate. Suppose you don't. Okay. Um, there still are reasons there that can be articulated, and they might be better or worse reasons. So there, uh, but often good ones, right? So if you don't, something, to be fully objective, you have to kind of understand it. If you don't understand it, though, that doesn't make it whim worship or, non -sub or subjective or horrible or some kind of treason. It means you haven't worked it through yet. Now, if you're, it takes work to understand things, and it's a lifelong process of understanding and refining and articulating your values. And no one's done it for every value at every moment to every degree of resolution. So it's subjective if you're on the premise, you know, it's mine, damn it, I don't want to look. I don't want to know any more about it. I just like fuchsia, and uh, I'm not interested in why. It, and, and you're really resistant to that. But even that resistance is understandable if the only kinds of thoughtful questions, if the only kind of questioning you're familiar with it is, well, you know, you should like blue-green. I mean, um, or whatever it is, and here's the reason why you should. Green is like the color of life, and fuchsia is like blood, which is a life dying. Yeah, some kind of rationalistic bs -y thing. If that's what it seems like it would be to you to try to understand your values, um, you know, 
subjectivism is um, an appealing alternative to that. So um, what I'm trying to offer as an alternative to both of them is I want to understand why I respond to this. And if I understand it better, I'll be able to get more out of it. And as to why values are sacred, values are your, your values are your life. Yeah. There's nothing more than that to value. I like to listen to music or look at paintings that match my emotional state. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's fine when I'm upbeat and happy and feel like I'm doing great. But I do that when I'm sad too. And is there a value in sad music or sad art that I'm pursuing? Or is that a hopeless sort of self-indulgence, a guilty indulgence? I don't think it's a guilty indulgence. How healthy it is in what circumstance and whether you could do too much of it and it could be part of a cycle of being all gloomy. M maybe uh, if you find that you're becoming overly morose or something, you might want to change your habits or talk to a therapist about it. But I think there is a real value of doing that. Because when you experience an emotion, you experience it as a kind of inarticulate thing. There's a kind of vague, fuzzy, hard to put your, get your head around it. And when you look at an artwork, it's like making it concrete. Yeah, this is what I'm feeling. It, it adds a kind of layer of comprehensibility and dealability with, cognitively, uh, to what you're feeling. It makes it something specific rather than something vague and floating. You could say, oh, there's a kind of experiential value to that, to having what you're feeling made crisp, um, whether you embrace or reject the feeling, um, whether, not embrace or reject the feeling, but embrace or reject the evaluations that are giving rise to that feeling. It can help you to do that, to have it made crisp, and it could help you just to understand yourself and experience yourself. And also, there's a value to experiencing negative emotions as well as positive emotions. They're part of reality. Um, if you try to hide from them, um, you're repressing and evading some of the facts that are, you know, um, some facts about your own psychology and maybe some of the facts of the world that you need to address that are creating the situations in which you're feeling these emotions. And if you do need to experience negative emotions sometimes, and it's good to recognize them and, and experience them, uh, artworks that help to bring that out can be, that help to kind of crystallize those emotions can be of real value. But I don't want to give sort of psychotherapeutic advice on, on when to do it. I'll just say this. Um, there was a period where, um, I guess I could say, uh, Something sad happened in, in my and my wife's uh, life. It's now worked out well, I'm happy to say. But um, we asked a friend of ours who was a therapist, or my wife did, like, is it a good thing to spend the day watching kind of sad movies and crying it out? And uh, we were assured that it was a healthy thing to do in that situation. So your mileage may vary, um, but sometimes it's recommended clinically. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. My question is about non-objective painting. Uh, the mm -hmm. abstract school would be an example, Jackson Pollock, a specific one. Mm -hmm. Does this meet the uh, definition of art as a selective recreation? I don't think it does. Um, but I also don't think all of it is evil. So I, I think there is something, I mean, which I think you get a real anger and hostility to this kind of thing in the Romantic Manifesto, and I think there's a reason for that, and, and it's a good reason, that we're thinking of a period where there was this real representational art that was concretizing metaphysical value judgments, and it's in museums, and this other stuff is kind of supplanting it, and it's throwing art out. And insofar as that's what we're doing, we're saying this thing, like this rug pattern, is art, and it's going to stand next to uh, the Last Supper or um, a Dolly's Last Supper, which I really like, or whatever. And you know, we'll frame this, and this is the same as that. What you're doing is inflating away the whole concept of art, and I think it's, there's something dark and malevolent about the motives behind that, and it's bad. And I think that's what Ayn Rand is responding to. But to give a more positive example of some kind of engagement with something that someone thinks is art, but I don't. I mean, we had Dave Rubin here last night. And uh, Yaron and Don Carr and Gina and a bunch of us filmed some episodes with Dave Rubin. You might have seen them. And in one of them, uh, he was talking to Yaron and Gina about art. 
and I wasn't on that, but I was in the green room in the back uh, um, watching. And he was saying, you know, my studio here, I filled it with art. I've got this painting and, you know, the artist knew I liked coffee, so she put coffee grinds in it. And it, and it was some sort of abstract painting, and he really liked it. Um, now, what's going on there? I mean, if he had a representational painting in the background behind speakers on his interview show, that would be a bad thing. It would be distracting. It wouldn't be good. This thing is better there than the Mona Lisa would have been or than a Vermeer would have been. The Vermeer would have been out of place. What's going on is that there's interior decorating taking place here. It's pretty good interior decorating as it goes. The coffee grinds, I don't know about, but the thing looked nice. It had a nice texture. It fit well into the situation. And the room does give a kind of value slant. It's decorated in a way where the decorations kind of feel consistent. It feels like it's creating a space with a certain character to it. It doesn't feel like some rooms you go into where like there's a random hodgepodge of stuff and it doesn't express any personality at all. Uh, I think this item is expressing this in this room as a piece of interior decorating. I think that's what Dave is responding to. He calls it art. I don't think it's really art. Um, I think it matters, that difference between it and art, for um, because they play different roles in your life and you, you wouldn't want to go see this thing in a museum and it's not going to inspire you, but it might you know, be a fun part of the room, like a beanbag chair or something. And um, so I think that difference matters. I think you know, it, if I have a longer chat with Dave about art sometimes, maybe we'll talk about that. But um, I don't think it's like bad that he likes this thing or bad that he has it on his set. And I think this is an example of thinking like, what is it that I get out of this? And you make a mistake, I think, by classifying it as art because you confuse what you get out of real art. And you don't know where to look for it when you want it and need it. But nonetheless, there is some value there of a different sort, I think. So non-abstract art, I think, is sometimes good interior decorating. At being stole the thunder from my question, but I'll ask it anyways in okay. case you have something more to add. Is there a cathartic function to art uh, versus in inspiring you? Um, is it a trap to avoid? Is it a part of refueling? I missed the beginning of what you said. What, what might be a trap to avoid? Uh, the cathartic function of art. Is there a cathartic function, like related to cathartic? Um, so I'm not understanding. Preparative? Catharsis. Catharsis function. Catharsis, like in Aristotle, talks about in, 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 in the poetics. Um, so Aristotle has this idea that art is about, I mean, catharsis is a Greek word for like cleaning, cleansing. And there's the idea that an artwork um, builds up this well of emotion and then releases it, and that we have a psychological need for that and that kind of cleansing. And this is discussed in the poetics. It's less a big deal in the poetics than people sometimes think. The poetics isn't all about cleaning your soul, but it does come up somewhat. Um, I mean, I think some art does that some of the time, and it can be of value. I don't think it's the central feature of what literature does, much less what all art in general does. And even there, it's a metaphor for something, and I'm, I don't think it's a metaphor for the whole of what art does, but for one function that's sometimes served by it. A real, a real example of a sharing artistic principles and producing very different works of art. Uh, it was a relationship between two giants of American musical theater, Stephen Sondheim and Oscar Hammerstein. When Sondheim was a boy for various circumstances, he grew up in Bucks County, uh, Pennsylvania, near the Hammerstein home. He became friendly with Hammerstein's son and became a surrogate member of the Hammerstein family. Oscar Hammerstein became his surrogate father. When he was a, in high school, Sondheim wrote a musical and asked ha Hammerstein to comment on it. And they had an appointment and met, and Hammerstein began the discussion by saying, this is the worst thing I've ever read, but, and he spent hours with Sondheim going through everything he wrote and explaining what worked and didn't work. As uh, many times Hammerstein has said, sorry, Sondheim has said, he learned more in that afternoon than he's learned in the rest of his lifetime on how to write musical theater. And he has said, even as a 80 year old, 80 year old man, Everything that Oscar taught me that day was important and true. And so here they shared the same principles for writing musical theater, 
But Hammerstein also said to him, write in your own voice. And if, you're, if anyone is familiar with the contrast between their musicals, Hammerstein was this very optimistic, positive, sense of life lyricist, Sondheim, who's brilliant, was also, is very dark. So here there were two giants of the musical theater. One learned his principles from the other, and as said, he, he thinks they were true and adopted them, and yet their musicals couldn't be more different in terms of uh, their, their style and sense of life. That's interesting, and it also speaks to sort of It's interesting to think about what's the same and different between them because in addition to having a very different emotional feel, a different sense of life conveyed by, by uh, Sondheim and Hammerstein, there also, my sense is there's a really different relation between the music and the lyrics in the two of them. And I think it's, it's significant that I guess Hammerstein was just a lyricist. At least I know of him always in collaboration with, uh, with a, a composer. And um, Sondheim, I mean, sometimes has worked with composers. I mean, there's West Side Story, but um, is more well known. Much of what he does is uh, is doing both, and there's a kind of sense of a predominance of lyrics uh, over melody in his. So it would be interesting to think about what those lessons were, and um, if they were confined to lyric writing, or if they also were about relations between lyric and melody, and um, we'd have to go really into these uh, figures to, uh, to think about it, but it is a good point of, even if you just look at them as poems, the lyrics, uh, Hammerstein lyrics and Sondheim lyrics are very different. Um, so thanks for that example. Thank you, Greg. That was a very interesting talk, as always. Um, Ayn Rand wrote about the standard of aesthetic uh, evaluation being the level of integration that a work of art achieves. Mm -hmm. Or it's and, one of them, yeah. Yeah, and most significant works of art are, you know, leaving aside the conceptual content or anything, you know, they're aesthetically mixed. There's very few works in any um, field of art that kind of approach perfection, right? Um, and I see a lot of people who are serious about, who take art seriously and want to analyze it and evaluate it. Uh, they approach, they seem to approach art in a sort of negative way where whatever standard they're using, if it's the level of integration or whatever, they'll be looking for ways in which a work of art doesn't live up to how well integrated they think it could be or whatever. Um, and given the fact that there's, you know, most art is mixed, it seems like that's not a very good way to find a lot of value in most of the art that's around us. So, and I think this was implicit in a lot of what you talked about, but do you have advice for how to approach aesthetic judgment in that respect in order to kind of maximize the amount of value that we can get out of it in our lives? Well, there are two places negativity so you're saying you have something that's got some good and some bad, and you've got this guy who's just like super sensitive to the bad and not to the good. Right. Um, and, and it's kind of a drag, and well, why is this? Okay, so there are two, uh, more than that, but there are, are two things at least that might be occurring, one of which is bad here and the other of which isn't. So one of which is that you have someone, and I think people are sometimes like this, who aren't looking for values in the world. They're looking for ways to dismiss things. They're not looking for things about what can I get out of this, and they just want to put it down. And that's usually coming from a place of insecurity or something like that. And so all they see is the negative in anything, and they're looking for the negative and gravitating towards it. And when they see somebody who likes something, if they can find something bad in the thing the person likes, they're like, ha, huh, you know, I, screw you, here's why this is bad. And that's, that is not a good kind of motivation. Uh, on the other hand, your negative responses to something um, are as much aesthetic responses and as much important to you sometimes as your positive responses, and with good reason. Look, that's not my world, or ooh, that's a math, right? It's a, it's a kind of genuine reaction to something that's important, an important part of your standards and your values, and what you might be doing if you watch a movie and you hate it, 
is try to like say, well, in the same reason that if you watch another movie and you love it, you want to think about what did I love about this movie and what, why was this movie so impactful on me in this positive way? Why was this movie so, ugh? Why, why, why did I have this so strong negative response? Or why was my response muted to it? Um, and that, doing that can also be part of the process of exploring your values, of getting clearer on what you want out of life. It's a genuine, good, value-oriented thing to do. So I think if that's what you're doing, or someone you know is doing when they're pointing out the negatives, that's valuable and good. All that said, if you find about yourself that um, you have tons of negative reactions to things, and all your time thinking about art is thinking about articulating what you don't like about things, you might want to try to find some stuff that you have more positive reactions to and focus as much as you can on the positives because um, you know, you'll get more out of life if you do that. Um, life is more about achieving values than avoiding a threat, avoiding negatives, and uh, you need to do both, but the avoiding of the bad should be subordinated to the acquiring of the good. And that's, I think, a note to end on. Great, thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.